Welcome to Glioblastoma, aka GBM, a podcast brought to you by the Glioblastoma Research Organization, highlighting stories of GBM warriors, caregivers, medical advisors, and more. Join us this season as we connect with members of our incredible community and have meaningful and insightful chats regarding all things glioblastoma. Please note that any information provided on the show is not meant to treat, diagnose, or prevent any disease, and all information that is discussed in our conversation is what worked for the individual themselves and should not be taken as advice. The information provided on this show is not a substitute for professional medical advice, and you should contact your medical provider and healthcare team with any questions. Dr. Henry Friedman, welcome to glioblastoma, a.k.a. GBM. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's wonderful to be here. Kicking things off, you know, aside from being a world-renowned neuro-oncologist, you are also a karaoke star. What is your favorite song to sing for karaoke? We'll Stop the Rain by Creedence. Second question, you're from the Northeast. What brought you to North Carolina? Followed a woman. Okay. So As many great people do. (laughs) Smart ones do. Met Joanne. Uh, when we were interns together in Syracuse. She came down to Duke in July of 80, and I followed her in January of 81. And I really didn't come so much for Duke as it came for Joanne, but it worked out great. And we've been faculty here. She's a doctor as well. We've been faculty since uh, 83. That's incredible. What made you decide to pursue a field in neuro-oncology? That's a funny story. I was in Syracuse uh, doing pediatrics, again, where I met Joanne. Then Dutch did a hematology-oncology fellowship with her uh, under Frank Gosky and his team. For my second year, I was sent into a laboratory to do work on red cell membranes. And I went back to Frank, who's a red cell doc, or was, rest in peace, and said, I hate this, it's boring, I don't want to do this ever again. He says, oh, God darn it. He says, you're going to want to be an oncologist. And all they do is push poisons. Okay, he didn't really like oncology, he was a hematologist. But he said, all right, I'm going to send you to Boston Children's, and you're going to do three a month of training in oncology, neuro-oncology. And you're going to come back, and you're going to do that for us, and you'll be our oncologist slash neuro-oncologist. Then when I went down to Duke to follow Joanne, uh, and they said to me, well, John Folletta was the division chief. He says, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, I'll do neuro-oncology. I had nothing else to think of, and they sent me into the laboratory of Daryl Bigner, and he's been a mentor ever since. That's incredible. For those that don't know, what is the difference between a neurologist, a neuro-oncologist, and a neurosurgeon? A neurologist is somebody who trains in the neurological system and the problems that can go wrong, um, multiple sclerosis, stroke, lots of different uh, things. A neuro-oncologist is someone who specializes in the treatment of patients with brain and spinal cord tumors, either in children or in adults. And the pathway there is either to be a neurologist then do a year of neuro-oncology or to be an oncologist and do a year or two subspecialized training in neuro-oncology. And people approach it different ways. I am a pediatrician, then a pediatric hematologist-oncologist, then a pediatric neuro-oncologist, then became an adult and pediatric neuro-oncologist, now focused primarily on adults. A neurosurgeon is a totally different category. They are people trained to be able to do actually operations um, on the brain and spinal cord. And I learned early on in med school that I would not be a good surgeon. Uh, And the true story, it's a shocker, the true story is that as a medical student, I sewed my glove to the last layer of a patient's wound um, in the operating room um, as they were closing. Didn't do it on purpose, of course. And the attending fell down laughing, got up and said, son, do you think you have a future in surgery? And I said, no, he was from the South. I said, that was my best Southern accent. I said, no, sir, I'm gonna be a uh, hematologist oncologist. He says, I love a man who knows his limitations. Um, and then the chief resident closed, and that was the end. And I got a great grade anyway. Okay. Still be great because I was so honest, but I can't do surgery. Right. For someone that's a neuro-oncologist as yourself, what does a normal day look like? Because obviously, you know, you oversee the Brain Tumor Center, and you also see patients, as you told me earlier. And you're also overseeing all these trials, and because you are, you know, director of the center, how does that work, and what does a normal day look like for you? Okay, so I'm actually one of the deputy directors. Okay. I'm Alan Friedman. Uh, who is not related to me. People think we're brothers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they think that he's my dad, which I can live with. Sometimes they think that I'm his dad, which I can't live with. (laughs) But we're just best friends, been working together for decades. Our deputy directors, David Ashley is the actual director Mm -hmm. of the center. And my job would be to oversee the clinical side of our program because the Preston Robertson Brain Tumor Center is a huge operation involving laboratory and clinical research and clinical care and supportive care. So uh, my job is really focused on the clinical arm of things. I um, see patients, a small number, 
I carry about 65 patients. My faculty carry far more. I am involved in the uh, recruitment of patients to the center and am really the gatekeeper for patients who come to us, or the majority of patients. And we probably get 3,000 hits, that is, people looking to come to us and see about 900 a year with adults, uh, adults with brain tumors, and maybe 100 with pediatric. I don't do the pediatric entry, I do the adult entry. Because modern medicine is so constrained now, financially, um, I spend a fair bit of time on philanthropy, and uh, we raise funds that are used to push the field forward. I go to clinics on Mondays and Tuesdays. The other three days, I work remote since uh, COVID came, and it's been an f- easy way to stay more productive mm-hmm. and get more things done. And so it's uh, quite a lot of things. I'm on the admissions committee for the School of Medicine for the last 15 years and counting. Alan and I developed a mentoring program for female varsity athletes who want to go to med school called Collegiate Athlete Pre-Medical Experience, or CAPE. And I love to mentor, need to mentor, mm-hmm. have to mentor. It's a visceral need for some good reasons. I have a full life. And then, of course, I'm a husband mm-hmm. and a dad and a granddad. Congratulations. And soon we're going to go from one two-year-old granddaughter to having three little girls under two and a half because my daughter-in-law is pregnant with fraternal twin girls. Congratulations. And my son Maybe and daughter. A, gr- a girl grandpa. <laughs> oh, my, my son and daughter-in-law are learning how to do zone defense mm-hmm. because man-to-man won't work. Okay. One goes left, one goes right, one goes deep up the middle. They can't do the coverage. Mm-hmm. So... so Someone comes to the Brain Tumor Center and they want to either be seen by you or someone at the institution. Like, what does a process look like for someone that comes to Duke for the first time? The first thing that happens for most of the patients is they approach us either through their, through their um, physician or much more commonly themselves with an email or a phone call. And we uh, respond the same day. It's always the same day. Mm-hmm. And we will look at, we'll get the record sent in and the images in particular, and then decide if a surgical intervention is the first thing that has to happen. If they didn't have surgery, do they get surgery or biopsy? If they only had a biopsy, should they have had a surgery? If they had a surgery, was it incomplete and they should have a better surgery? And Alan Friedman and I do that every night, almost every day of the year. He's done it when he's been in South Korea. I've done it from England and from France, um, uh, Italy, and we make sure that we decide do they need a surgical procedure first? And I have all business going to Alan, and then he makes that decision. If they don't need a surgical procedure, then we look to see what we can offer them. Uh, we have clinical trials, a lot of them, and we have a lot of interventions that are outside of standard of care, but not on clinical trial, which is sort of unique mm-hmm. in neuro-oncology. Most places won't do that. And then they're set up for a consultation. There are eight faculty in neuro-oncology. By October, there'll be 10. We are a heavily APP, which is uh, nurse practitioners and PAs driven program. Uh, There's a research team. There's a uh, clinical care team with nurse clinicians. It's a busy program, but it works with one philosophy in mind. At Duke, there is hope. You're cured till proved incurable, Mm -hmm. no matter what you have. And that's not the way of the world. As you probably know all too well, there is a real belief out there that for certain of the brain tumors, especially things like glioblastoma, you're dead the day you're diagnosed. And that's like going into a sporting event saying, we can't win, you have no chance. Mm -hmm. And I'm a basketball addict, Duke basketball in particular. I think Um, my dad was a UConn player, so I think we're rivals. (laughs) Yeah, I was at the, um, I brought my kids to the 1999 Final Four in Tampa, Mm -hmm. where we had clearly the best team in the country. No question, we would have won in a seven game series. But in the one and done format, they beat us. Yes. Oh, you can't. Ch- All right, we're done. All right. <laughs> He's like, I'm leaving the doors that Time way. Time <laughs> out. That was hard. On the way home, Sarah was crying. My son was upset. The plane was filled with UConn fans who were cheering. <laughs> it was a very hard Final Four. But in 2001, 2010, 2015. Oh, he's back. That's why he didn't, that's why we he didn't leave. There. <laughs> we went to all those Final Fours and we won. My son actually learned that he made Duke. He was accepted into Duke about 10 minutes after we uh, won the game against Arizona. Oh, wow. So um, That was a good day to celebrate. That was a very good day. That's amazing. That was a very good day. We'll never forget that. And my daughter graduated. They both went to Duke. 
because I have graduated in 2010, mm -hmm. and that's the year that um, a John Shire-led team, thank God the butler shot missed at the end, but there was an illegal screen that wasn't called, mm -hmm. um, that should have been called. Um, so even if it had gone in, it shouldn't <laughs> have counted. We've gone from Brain Cancer Podcast to Basketball but it Sports counted. Talk. And now John is a great friend and <laughs> did an unbelievable job this year as mm -hmm. the first-year coach for Duke. That's amazing. Well, congratulations. But I guess back to brain tumors, huh? Okay. No. Okay. I'm all for basketball. My dad's in the, the UConn like, Hall of Fame. Really? Yeah. He's a point guard. Wow. Pretty cool. So does that mean that you inherited his athletic genes? I did. I was a ballerina for most of my life. And, like, my parents had, like, my dad was like, she's going to like, be a basketball player. My mom was like, she's going to be a ballerina. My mom like, won the fight. But, like, I still play basketball for fun. Not great at it. But I could have been, like, pretty good. I I'll think. tell you. 5'9". Okay. So my daughter... Um, is a very good basketball player, but she's 5'3". My okay. wife is 5'1", and I don't think she ever forgave her for that. So she played club basketball at Duke. Oh, that's um, Rather so than go D3 somewhere, which she could have done. And my son was a Blue Devil mascot for uh, three years. So we've got sort of athletic genes uh, in our family, but not really. <laughs> There's no athletic genes that are flowing there. Are you still, aside from, you know, on your off time, like, do you partake in, like, any, like, athletic sports, or what do you like to do? I know you have plantar fasciitis at the moment <laughs> but aside from that what i do is uh workouts um four days a week with my trainer mm -hmm. i used to do it in the gym then came covid and so we started doing it by zoom i've got all the equipment i need in the house it's so much easier mm -hmm. it's so much more flexible if i'm late or he's running late we still get to uh, engage so four days a week i work out mm -hmm. i do cardiac on a bike it's a recumbent bike or walking and um i've got the single best athletic trainer on earth called Hap Zarzor, who runs athletic training uh, at Duke, who sees me once a week and um, keeps me going. That's amazing. I'd rather have orthopedic type or musculoskeletal injuries than cardiac. And my dad died when I was 11. He was 55 of his first and only MI. Wow. And so that's a family genetics sort of, uh, sort of Damocles hanging over my head. And I'm checking or unchecking the boxes that he checked. He was overweight. He didn't exercise. He was hypertensive. Nobody knew about lipids in 1963 to, mm -hmm. the, to an extent that really mattered. And uh, smoked. I don't do any of those things. Okay. So I'm now 71 and plan to do what my mom did. And she passed rest in peace in 95, when she was 95 years old. So wow. So I intend to keep working, hopefully, for another couple of decades. That's incredible. It's fun. We're happy you're doing everything that I'm you are. I'm going to do what I am. But I intend to... Um, I'd rather have a sore shoulder, a sore leg, or a sore foot than somebody say, okay, you need three vessel replacement. I don't want that. No. No, that's not good. It doesn't sound good at all. No, it's not, <laughs> it's not good at all. Well, 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 you had me when you said you're an athlete and you played basketball. That's terrific. Were you a forward, or, or what did you play? I would just play basketball and shoot in the hoop. I wasn't, like, a player. Okay. I'm not sure I believe. I have videos of me, like, I would put, like, my, my phone in, like, the corner of the court, and then just, like, I was part of, like, the – the New York Health and Racket Club when uh -huh, I was living in the uh -huh. city for a while. And so they had like basketball courts at the one that I used to go sure. to. And I would just go shoot and I would like record myself and send videos to my dad. And I would make like one shot in 30 and he'd be like, there it is. And like, it was, it was really funny. Did you show him all 30 or just the one that hit? <laughs> I mixed it up sometimes. Okay, no worries, no worries. <laughs> he was like, that was really embarrassing. And I think from that point on, I would only send him the good ones. But it was still fun. Of course. So anyways, back to brain tumors. Yes. The Preston Robert Tisch Brain Tumor Center is one of the most highly regarded centers in the country. Why do you think that is? Interesting. I would say it is the program in the country, as okay. opposed to one of them, although people would tell me, don't be that much over the top, but we really are special. It's because of a lot of things. We have, we're 86 years old now, mm -hmm. um, although the Preston Robert Tisch Brain Tumor Center was really formed about 15 uh, years ago, and it was formed because of the extraordinary generosity of the Tisch family. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege and honor of taking care of Bob Tisch, mm -hmm. who had a GBM. The family has been easily a most important patron, and because of them and the support that they have and continue to give us, we have been able to do things we'd never be able to do. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of grant funding. We have a lot of support, but they took us to a new level. Mm -hmm. So I think there were probably several milestones. One was the 2002 60 Minutes, which shined a light on us that we had not had shine, shown us before. Uh, that was particularly bright, and a lot of people around the world knew about us. And then when the family made their first extraordinary donation to us and we changed the name 
to the Preston Robert Tisch Brain Tumor Center, our world changed. Mm -hmm. And since then, we've just continued to grow. That's incredible. And I think we're doing good work. Definitely. And before the podcast started, you also mentioned that there's different there's difference between just like a cancer center and a center of excellence. Do you want to maybe explain that and also share some centers of excellence that let's say someone gets diagnosed where they're able to, where you can suggest to, to go check out? Sure. When people get diagnosed with any medical problem, they can stay at a local hospital, which may be fine depending on if you've got simple pneumonia, you've got a hernia. Then when you get something a little bit more complex like cancer, you're better off going to a cancer center. And there are cancer centers all, over, all throughout the country. When you get more subspecialized than that and you get into the problem of a brain tumor, I think you need to go to a brain tumor center. Mm -hmm. uh, a high volume, meaning a lot of patients, center of excellence that really are devoted to the care of patients in that area of medicine. And I think that when that happens, the data is pretty clear from both U.S. and European studies Patients with brain tumors who go to high volume centers of excellence live longer and live better. If you don't, I think that you don't live as long and you don't live as well. So I'm not going to say anything negative about anybody, but I will answer your question about where I think are particular centers of excellence. For me, the centers of excellence that I think about in neuro-oncology, of course, would be the center at Duke. Mm -hmm. um, I think about Memorial Sloan Kettering. I think about MD Anderson. I think about UCLA, and I think about UCSF. And there are others around the country, but those five come to mind as the programs where I think some really special things are being done for patients like that. Sadly, there are barriers for patients going to these centers. Some is geographical. Mm -hmm. you, you live in places that are difficult to access those centers. Some of it is insurance. I think that many people find that they're not covered to leave their own network or even worse, they don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. That's a major problem in this country, that a lot of people don't have health care insurance. Obamacare has been a godsend in many ways, but there are still a number of states, Texas and Florida come to mind, where it's never been embraced, and they have millions and millions of people without health insurance. Mm -hmm. I won't turn this into a political discussion, but to say that I think everybody deserves health insurance. Mm -hmm. I think that's a human right uh, and a human dignity. But those centers are places that I think really push the envelope and really can help patients cope and th even thrive with the diseases that they present with. And speaking of Duke, how does it feel to be the deputy director of such a large and innovative institution? I think it's great. I, I have been at Duke for 42 years. Wow. Um, I came in 80, again, I came in 81 to follow uh, my wife here, or my wife-to-be. We weren't married then. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very special place. I think that what we do is such a privilege and an honor to provide this kind of care that I enjoy my work immensely, which is why when we had our new chair come in, Jerry Grant, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, because I'm 71, and, you know, people talk about retiring. And I said, well... If I stay division chief, because I'm chief of the Division of Medical Neuro-Oncology within neurosurgery and the deputy director of the center, or one of the deputy directors, and you let me continue to bring the patients in and generate philanthropy for our program, we'll talk again when I'm 80. Mm -hmm. And then by then we'll do, at that time, we'll do five-year renewals. And he said, go for it. And so I'm here. It's amazing. I'm not leaving. Are there any particular trials or innovations that are coming up specifically at Duke that you're excited about? TNTC, too numerous to count, but some of the really, I think, hot ones, certainly polio was a major splash, mm -hmm. and we are now about to open it in a new format that I think will be um, even more exciting mm -hmm. than the first one, and the first one's a very good positive trial. Mm -hmm. We're using a... I think that's the one that I was talking about, that's actually. That's the one you were talking about. That was like 18 years ago. Um, or it was a while. It was many years ago. Maybe not 18. The study with polio really goes back a long time. I don't have the full timeline, but we were doing that heavily in the 2010, 2011, 2012 mm -hmm. period. I'm pretty sure that's what I was talking about when I said that my dad had seen a trial at Duke, and I'm pretty sure it was for polio. It was 2015 that uh, 60 Minutes did the first double segment on that, and it's been a very good trial, but it needs to be made better. We have a trial using a monoclonal antibody called D2C7, which is conjugated to a toxin that is injected directly into the tumor, mm -hmm. um, as polio was, over 72 hours, followed by a, another agent, an anti-CD40, that boosts the immune system right into the brain. Mm -hmm. um, now we're doing that, only we're also adding the anti-CD40 into lymph nodes in the neck because we think we can boost the immune system even more. 
the new polio trial is going to be doing the modified polio virus into that site as well as into um, uh, brain. Question the, I have to interrupt quickly. Please. If you, if you have a brain tumor and you're saying that you're injecting, you know, let's say polio in mm -hmm. this particular instance into the tumor, wouldn't you, isn't the first thought normally to have surgery to take it out, but you're, I guess you guys keep it in? So that's actually a brilliant question. Thank you. It, it, and I'm not just flattering because I want to come back <laughs> again, but I wouldn't mind coming back again because I said, as I said, any microphone, any camera that I can be in front of. Henry Friedman loves the camera. <laughs> uh, and the me I love the camera. I love the media. I love talking. Um, I probably talk too much. That's the just because you're, you're from New York. Uh, yes, I'm from New York. And uh, when I'm with New Yorkers, I tend to talk. Can I have a little water from the faucet, please? Um, but anyway, the original polio trial was for recurrent disease, um, recurrent GBM. Mm -hmm. And we would inject it directly into the tumor. The original D2C7 trial was the same way. But we've learned through a bunch of people that if you take the tumor out and then you simply inject into the wall that was around the tumor mm -hmm. where there is a so-called flare image, uh, you have a ton of tumor cells. And you can do that without having the problem of a, a dying necrotic tumor producing swelling and complications. So for the new polio trial, we're going to resect the tumor if it's resectable. Some tumors can't be resected. Mm -hmm. Some areas of the brain can't, you can't work. It's just too, too dangerous. Mm -hmm. And then we will inject into the wall of the crater mm -hmm. the modified polio virus. And then we're going to be uh, utilizing um, that also going into lymph nodes on the same side as the tumor to boost the immune response even more. For the D2C7 trial, we've done that same sequence. But the news there that's exciting is we're going to start to do that very, very soon, any day now, mm -hmm. in newly diagnosed GBM. Patient oh, with a newly wow. diagnosed tumor, you resect the tumor, and instead of starting with radiation and Timidar, the standard of care, mm -hmm. we inject into the wall of the crater. We will do the same thing as we've done with when we inject into the tumor. We'll follow that maybe four or six weeks later with radiotherapy and Timidar, and then go back to doing more injections into the neck. So we're constantly refining what we're doing, trying to improve the outcome and minimize the side effects. Uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. If you really want to know what we're doing, bring in uh, David Ashley. I actually, actually am. You are. In two weeks. David's coming? Yeah. Okay, then the audience can decide who they think um, <laughs> is um, uh, better looking okay. um, and who they think is more articulate. But he talks funny. He's an Australian. He's Australian, yeah. Yeah, and um, he, I actually trained him. He was my fellow. That's in incredible. Pediatric neurooncology back in the 90s. Wow. And thank God I treated him nicely because he came back to be my boss now as head of the center and he treats me nicely. That's good. But you've got David coming. Yeah. Anybody else from Duke that's on your list? No, for this season, just the two of you. I think Stay you're going to have for a, season three. I think you're going to have a great time with David. <laughs> thank he is you. just terrific. You know, but he may say, hey, mate, can I have a little, I don't know what the heck they drink, um, or ask him to bring some Aussie uh, meat pies. Okay. Uh, and he'll, he'll explain what that is, which I just learned about okay. pretty recently. That's gonna, David's going to enjoy uh, yeah, talking excited. to you and vice versa. That's terrific. Yeah. What is some advice that you typically give to your patients, if any? The major philosophy that we have always given our patients, and this goes back probably 30 years, um, one, somebody who ran our family support program, B.B. Gwill, ultimately became an ordained minister, coined the phrase, a Duke, there is hope. And I think that that really is what we imbue in them, that don't read Dr. Google, don't go on the net, don't look at the, all the, the grim details that are out there, but instead really just remember that we're offering you novel therapy. Even when it's standard of care, we're going to branch off and do some other things as well. So there's hope, mm -hmm. and that there's an ever-increasing cohort of patients who will beat this disease. Now I'm talking specifically because of what we are focused on, on GBM, mm -hmm. but for all the brain tumors. Mm -hmm. But hope is a powerful weapon. I, have a, I do a lot of uh, mentoring where I have students read books so we can discuss them and I can get a handle on their um, intellect and their ability to think. And one of the books I think is most powerful is The Anatomy of Hope by mm -hmm. Dr. Jerome Groupman, who I've never met, but we've spoken on the phone. We've referred patients to each other and I think has written a brilliant story of how hope can actually impact on your ability to handle what you're doing and may even have biological effects that uh, impact on your outcome. Mm -hmm. That's what we tell them. 
Biodexa Pharmaceuticals is proud to sponsor the glioblastoma, aka GBM, podcast. Biodexa Pharmaceuticals is a small biotechnology company hoping to make a big difference in the treatment of glioblastoma. Using their proprietary nanotechnology, Biodexa is developing liquid formulations of an investigational drug which can be delivered directly and locally into the tumor via an implanted catheter. This drug has been previously investigated in pediatric patients with brain tumors. Biodexa Pharmaceuticals is currently running a clinical trial in patients with recurrent glioblastoma known as the MAGIC G1 trial. To find out more about the MAGIC trial, visit magictrials.com. Imagine waking up from brain tumor removal surgery knowing that your radiation treatment is already underway. That's how gametile therapy works. At the end of brain tumor removal surgery, the neurosurgeon implants the gametiles where the tumor is most likely to return. So instead of waiting to start daily standard radiation treatments that go for weeks, you get a head start against tumor cells and get back to your life sooner. For operable brain tumors of all types, including glioblastomas, brain metastases, menginomas, gametile therapy is a one-time targeted radiation treatment with fewer side effects and a far less chance of hair loss than external radiation. Gametile therapy is tough on tumors and easier on patients and caregivers. Learn more at gametile.com. Gametile therapy is an FDA-cleared radiation therapy for patients with newly diagnosed malignant brain tumors and recurrent brain tumors. Novacure is pleased to support the glioblastoma, aka GBM, podcast. Novacure strives to extend survival in some of the most aggressive forms of cancer through the development and commercialization of their innovative therapy called tumor treating fields. Novacure partners with the glioblastoma research organization to work together on behalf of patients and their loved ones impacted by GBM. To learn more, visit novacure.com. Rune was built by a team of patients, caregivers, and medical experts, consisting of neurosurgeons, neuro-oncologists, psycho-oncologists, radiation oncologists, nurse practitioners, and social workers who have devoted their lives to treating and helping glioblastoma patients. For anyone navigating GBM, Rune offers a wealth of medically vetted digestible video answers to common questions. Answers are organized into major topics ranging from surgery to radiation to caregiver mental health. Check it out at rune.com. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take an even bigger plug, and I'll win half your audience over now, which is that, you know the um, the sign of a... You know how you can tell if a man is smart? No. They marry up. Okay. That's the definition of a smart man. Okay. So right now, some of the men out there are thinking, yeah, that's probably okay, and some of the other men are thinking, huh, what's he talking about? And all the women are saying, boy, that guy's great. <laughs> so another question I had, uh-huh. um, which I thought of, you mentioned, you know, going back to where you inject the polio into the tumor wall. We're fully 180 here. My question is, you mentioned that you are injecting the the vaccine into the lymph nodes on the same side of the body, but isn't the lymphatic system's everywhere, so why wouldn't you just, like, what difference does it make whether it's the same side or if it's all over, if it's everything circulating? This is where I'm going to have to sort of say that I know a lot of what we're doing, but for some of what we're doing, doing I don't know the complete rationale. Okay. So it's a modified poliovirus. Mm-hmm. Matthias Grohmeyer um, is the genius who basically created it from um, a sort of a, uh, a modification of the old Sabin vaccine, the oral vaccine that mm-hmm. doesn't get play in this country now for a lot of reasons. And the notion that putting it into the lymph nodes on the same side made sense to me, but I don't think I could tell you why that side or the other. And if Daryl Biggers listening to this, he's saying, oh my God, I got to talk to you again. Or Anik Desjardins, who runs clinical research for us, she'll say, Henry, how could you not know the answer to that? And I'm going to say, I don't know, but I'll make sure that um, David knows so that when he comes back, if you ask him that question, Perfect. he'll give you the answer. Perfect. And if I ever, ever, ever want to apply to Duke Medical School, I know how to get my in now. I got the good questions. I certainly <laughs> know how to help people get into Duke Med. I don't control or medical school. I don't control that process. But I know what medical schools, Duke and others, are looking for, and that's why our mentoring program for CAPE has been so successful for female varsity athletes mm-hmm. who want to go to medical school. Mm-hmm. Um, I know what medical schools are looking for because I'm on a committee that helps pick the class. And so, again, I don't pick the class, but I know how to make someone's application competitive mm-hmm. for applying to medical school anywhere. Do you want to share that for those that are potentially interested in like, you know? Yes, but particularly if you tell me that you're interested in that. Are you? I don't know. I've toyed with the idea. What's what's the, what's the movie where at the end he says, Louis, this is the beginning of a great friendship with um, Humphrey Bogart. Casablanca. I haven't seen it. 
I'm really bad with movies. You're a like, millennial, aren't you? Or are you younger than a millennial? You're not Gen yeah. Z. I think I'm like millennial, yeah. I think you're millennial. Yeah. Um, I just like particularly happen to be very bad with watching movies. Okay. Okay, that's, that's But like fine. the classics only. But I'm you, good at everything else, but I just, all like Forrest Gump, haven't seen it. But like you could, main ones. Oh, I know. God. I'm mentoring it. I won't mention her name, but I'm mentoring a 19-year-old <laughs> uh, a who has not seen a number of things. I'm going, oh, how could you not have seen that? Okay, so for medical school, mm -hmm. what you need to do is you obviously need to have good grades. Mm -hmm. um, it's helpful but not pivotal that you have a good score in the MCAT. You want to have clinical exposure. That is, you want to have seen, um, in some setting, patients. Uh, it's very preferable to have done research of some sort, clinical or laboratory research. You want to do community service. You want to show evidence of leadership skills. You want to interview well, because um, unlike in law school, my son's a lawyer, mm -hmm. went to Stanford Law, he's done some wonderful things, including four years with President Obama in the White House, wow. in the White House Counsel's Office. And my daughter is also a professional who uh, went to uh, Duke, as Josh did, and then Penn for a master's in nonprofit uh, leadership. You really want to show in some way when you um, interview your ability to think on your feet and make eye contact because so much of it's done by zoom now which is a sterile technique for interviewing mm -hmm. and, and and really just articulate your passion why do you want to be a physician what do you think about these different scenarios that are thrown at you and um, law school doesn't interview med schools do i think law schools can have a wider range of people in law school who may not be um, people people so to speak mm -hmm. in med school i think we're better at weaning that out we're not perfect but i think we are better at it because we do interview mm -hmm. and that's a big difference between the two professions okay but for going into med school th there are there are just a lot of things to do but i guide a lot of people on that process and i'm pretty successful at it what's the best advice that you would give to family or friends of someone that has a brain tumor so first thing and this really comes from very sardonic sarcastic book called The House of God mm -hmm. by Samuel Shem, take your pulse. Mm -hmm. Just slow down, take a breath. Don't let yourself be rushed into something. So many patients just get rushed into an intervention and they think they have no choices. Just stop, think for a second. The best resource on the net is Al Musella Guide uh, to Patients with Brain Tumors. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a brilliant work that goes through everything. Uh, yes, I wrote the forward or one of the parts of the forward and I'm in the book but that's not why I'm promoting it. <laughs> um, but Al is probably the best, uh, no, not probably, is the single best uh, patient advocate for mm -hmm. patients with brain tumors in the country, patients and families, a family diagnosis. And then start to find out where the centers are that are near you that your insurance will allow you to go to um, so that you can really, from the first moment, start off with a center that really knows how to take care of you. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other th advice I would give is to say, don't let anybody tell you that whatever's going on is hopeless because they'll be right. So in 91, we played UNLV in the semis of the Final Four. Mm -hmm. And there was everybody in the country saying, no way Duke is going to beat UNLV because um, look at what happened in 90 where we lost by 30 points. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're just you can't do it. The philosophy was not we can't beat him. The philosophy was we're going to beat him. And Mike Krzyzewski great friend, best coach of ever, of, of all time, said to his team, they've never been in a close game. UNLV has always blown everybody out. If we keep it a close game, we will win. And they won. So it's, it's a, I love the sports analogy. Mm -hmm. In sports, you have to go in with the mindset of being able to compete successfully. As a ballerina, my, my wife did ballet for about 14 years. You go in there saying, you're not going to fall, you're not going to trip, you're not going to not get carried appropriately with your partner. You're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And that mindset is so important for anything that you do, whether it be ballet, sports, medicine. Incredible. And I have a few quick questions, mm -hmm. like, you know, Q&A style that were submitted by some patients and caregivers. Mm -hmm. The first one is, what should I do if my loved one has a seizure? I think the first thing you want to do is to make sure they're not in a position where they're going to hurt themselves. So God forbid they're driving and you're driving with them, you've got to get the car steered to safety. If they're in a safe, or if they're swimming, you've got to make sure that they're going to stay safe. Mm -hmm. If they're just sitting in your living room, you want to make sure that they are not in a situation, especially if it's a generalized tonic-clonic major motor seizure, they're not in a position where they're going to aspirate or the tongue's going to roll back. So you put them on the side, make sure the airway is clear and call for help. The next question is, under what circumstances do doctors prescribe dexamethasone? 
while in neuro-oncology, we use dexamethasone frequently because you need it to counteract the swelling that a tumor can produce. Mm -hmm. So it's used routinely for symptom control. It's used routinely after surgery, but it's a double-edged sword. It has a lot of side effects on the long haul, has side effects on the short haul. And if you're doing immunotherapy, even as little as four milligrams of decadron or dexamethasone can impede the immune system. Mm -hmm. So we use as little decadron as we can in any given system, any given setting. The, the, the word we use is give the smallest amount that you can get away with. And how does it work? Let's say, you know, you have a patient that successfully completed a clinical trial. At, at what point do you wean someone off of decadron? Oh, in general, patients are weaned off decadron well before that. Okay. So after surgery, um, uh, typically you get them off decadron pretty quickly. After a biopsy, it's not so easy. During radiotherapy, you may need it. But there's another drug out there called Avastin, which do played a pivotal role in getting developed and getting approved by the FDA. And it has anti-tumor properties, but also lets you minimize the use of decadron. Mm -hmm. It has its own side effects. There are a lot of people out there who think it's um, overused, and those people would be wrong. Um, and there's people who think there's a really good reason to use it, and those people would be right. We use it a lot. And we have been able to reduce the decadron need in lots of patients by using um, uh, Avastin, which intriguingly, now they're generic, so it's not, I'm not promoting any company. I know there's a lot of um, gen generics that are out there for it. But what you find is that it also augments the immune, resist the immune system. So if you give on immunotherapy, you've got a swelling, and you've got to do something about it, we're much more likely to use Avastin than we're going to use Bevacizumab, then we're going to use same thing, then we're going to use Decadron. Okay. What have you seen with immunotherapy? Does it work with glioblastoma? I think the initial work using things like checkpoint inhibitors has been uniformly unhelpful, mm -hmm. despite a lot of work being done on that. I think where immunotherapy is making its mark slowly but surely is with vaccines. So there are certain vaccines that appear to be really changing the outcome for some patients. Um, and in those settings, things like checkpoint inhibitors in combination with the vaccine seem particularly promising. So immunotherapy has not had the major impact it has in something like melanoma, where it's such an immunogenic tumor. Immunotherapy does wonderful things, but I think we're chipping away at the problem. And I think immunotherapy is going to continue to have an ever-increasing role in the treatment of brain tumors, not only high-grade, potentially low-grade as well. And my last question, is there any particular diet that you would recommend to patients like before or after surgery, during treatment, at any point in their brain cancer journey? There's a lot of discussions about different kinds of diet. The ketogenic diet in particular has gotten a lot of play. And my comment is uh, it's not ready for prime time, stealing a line from uh, SNL. I think that, um, I love SNL, <laughs> I think that the ketogenic diet has yet to be proven to be beneficial. A new article just came out recently, I think it was in neuro-oncology, one of the other journals, healthy cardiovascular diet. Don't live on fast food. Eat the usual food groups that you would to keep your body healthy, your heart healthy, and you can't starve the cancer, mm -hmm. so that's not going to be a beneficial approach. Just eat a healthy diet. Um, I'm pretty good about that. I'm not perfect, but uh, reasonably good about my diet. Mm -hmm. um, I could be better, but I'm not. It happens sometimes. Well, everybody's got to have a weakness. Right. What's your... Like, what's your one junk food that, like, you would say is your, like, weakness? Mm, just one, huh? Um, Let's pick three. <laughs> I hate to say it, I love cookies. I mean, I love cookies, and I try to avoid them as much as I can, but occasionally I'll have them. Pie, cake, I mean... I don't eat much of it because I, I want to keep my weight flat again because my dad's risk factors that he dropped mm -hmm. down on me. I want to stay uh, reasonably lean. And as you can tell, I'm reasonably lean, people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, although it is a bulky hoodie, but I took it off, you'd see I'm lean. Those would probably be my vices. Okay. And pretzels. I Spoken love pretzels. like a true New Yorker. I, oh, when I go to New York, <laughs> invariably, I go down, I st we stay in the, um, always, same place. We always stay in the Regency. Okay. which is the uh, one of the Lowe's hotels, the Tisch Hotel. A couple of blocks away from us, you can easily go to the stands that sell uh, pretzels. Sometimes you have to go to the Central Park to get them. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll get three of those bagel pretzels, mm -hmm. um, and they last me the trip while I'm there. And even when they get hard, they're still delicious. Salt, <laughs> word no mustard. To, word to the wise. <laughs> yeah, well, I think they're Advice wonderful. from Henry Freeman. I love it with salt, <laughs> not so much with mustard, although some people prefer mustard. Okay. But invariably when I wear mustard, I get on it. I wear it on my uh, on my hoodie or whatever clothing I'm wearing. So, messy eater. 
Well, Henry, thank you so much for joining me on this episode. I'm so excited we finally got to meet and chat about all things brain tumors, basketball, and um, boys. You're going to bring me back? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. We're good. Are we good? <laughs> That's a wrap. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Are you seriously thinking? That's it for this week's show. Thank you so much for tuning in again to another episode of Glioblastoma, a.k.a. GBM. To get in touch with our organization, visit us online at gbmresearch.org or visit us on Instagram or Facebook at Glioblastoma Research. Visit us on Twitter at glioblastoma.org or visit us on LinkedIn at Glioblastoma Research Organization. To make a donation to the organization, which is fully tax deductible, visit us online at gbmresearch.org where you can designate your donation in honor of someone or find other methods that you can make a donation with. Thank you again for supporting us, for supporting the show, and we'll see you next week. Welcome back to another deep dive with Stash Strong. Today, let's go over this episode with Dr. Henry Friedman. What was your biggest takeaway? Yeah, I thought it was fascinating how he talked about checking your pulse Mm -hmm. and, and making sure you're not rushing into something, which is it the probably hardest thing in the opening days and weeks when you learn of a GBM diagnosis because you're just frantically trying to figure things out? Mm-hmm. And when someone who's spent their entire life as a neurosurgeon, oncologist, whatever it may be, but in that case, a neurosurgeon comes to you with an approach, who, who am I, right? As someone who's never lived in the medical space to like think differently. But mm-hmm. as Dr. Friedman said, I think it's, it's so important to hear, don't rush, right? And I know it's hard at that beginning stage and you might have to rush based on tumor and and what's going on Mm -hmm. in your specific case but the importance of a second opinion how did you feel hearing a doctor tell you just to like take a second yeah it's it's important because i've talked to a lot of people who they do not hear that Mm -hmm. right from from whether it's the first place they went or even after recurrence they kind of just you know stay with it's like well this is what we can offer you did you hear like did you hear that when you went with your brother's diagnosis? Like that, some, did someone ever tell you just to like take a breath? We we didn't, um, I'm trying to think back to those. And I mean, it, that's a thing. You look back five and a half years ago and it was, it was an absolute zoo, but we we stepped back. We were a very analytical family. And mm-hmm. I like, I vividly remember my brother at the lake, like a pros and cons board, right? Mm-hmm. What is good about having surgery here, getting treatment here? What's not? What else is available? So like as a family, we just did that naturally as, you know, we used to divvy up chores in, in, you know, in the summer and, and have like a whole process of like who was going to get what, right? So like that's mm-hmm. who we were. It's pretty intimidating to sit there with a neurosurgeon, neuro-oncologist, and they're presenting what you need to do. Surgery was three days later. Mm-hmm. We knew we had to remove it. It was pretty large. But again, I don't even think we knew about a second opinion at that point, right? Mm-hmm. And now it's one of the first things I tell any family who calls us, get a second opinion. Mm-hmm. Are there any things in regards to like taking a pause and taking a breath that you feel like that you've either lived through or have heard from people that have come to your organization as far as like tips or tricks and what you would maybe recommend? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, I'll say we didn't take a breath Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that everything just happened very quickly, right? A a Labor Day, normal day, my brother had a seizure. Next thing you know, it was a scan. Next thing you know, it was a mask. My parents were coming in from out of state. My sister was coming in. We just you know, yeah, clicked, like right? But I think there were points, um, you know, during his diagnosis, like we had to take a breath, right? Mm-hmm. You have to level set where you're at. What does GJ want, right? Mm-hmm. What did my brother want, right? What, it, what, is, what are the doctors saying? What's available, right? Instead of just jumping to a conclusion. Because again, there's, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. Mm-hmm. There's no r- true right or wrong, right? Yeah. And every D and every sequence, tumor is different, every location is different, every age is different. There's so many factors, but just taking a breath, just in general, I think during a, a diagnosis and, and a fight is so important to just level set where you're at. Yeah. Maybe like moving into the ne- another question, not necessarily taking a breath, but are there any things that you particularly like to do as far as like to take a step back, little mindfulness, wellness, meditation yeah. kind of situation? I mean, I think that's everything, especially when you're in the midst of it. Mm-hmm. Um, for me at the time, it, it was writing and it was running, right? So that's how Stastron kind of started. I just mm-hmm. was writing on my own, just like get my thoughts on paper because I had so much just I didn't know head. that Strong started because of your writing. So I, I basically wrote and created a website behind the scenes, like therapeutically oh, and captured like my that. family's like stories and how they 
were feeling. And, and then I sat with my brother and was like, hey, this is what I've been building. We can never talk about this again or we can, you know, this might be something. And, and again, he immediately is just different. He was mm-hmm. like, no, we're doing this. So that's the moment Stash Wrong was born when my brother – six months into his diagnosis thought he was more fortunate than others with GBM and he wanted to do more. And that's kind of how Stash Strong was born. But for me, that was like, that was therapeutic. Right. Mm-hmm. And then just running, I would yeah. just, just get outside and run, right. Like, empty your brain. <laughs> how did you feel knowing that like your brother was excited to do this? Like, how did that make you feel? I mean, that is the sole reason we exist. And it's the reason we built the community we built because of how he handled things. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, I always think if the roles were reversed, I do not think I would have wanted that. And mm-hmm. I and I it's probably hard surprising for people to hear, but like he had a lot to deal with mm-hmm. at 28 turning 29 right after diagnosis and he took on an additional, you know, role and and an avenue to help others. He can't, he always said like I want to help people who are less fortunate than me because he had no symptoms mm-hmm. right off the bat. And again, when you you say it in, you know, in memory and, and whatnot, those 18 months doing Stash Strong together, we flew. Like we we just ran and we spoke at events because it was a brother. It was a GJ was a patient. Mm-hmm. I was a brother. I changed his op tune. Like we were inseparable, and we were deciding to do something more with our family to to start an organization. So um, we didn't take a lot of steps back and and take a breath at that time because we just so much was going on, but Mm -hmm. um, there were points where I could point to that it was very important to take a step back and assess the situation. Yeah, that's super cool. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Deep Dive with Stash Strong. We will see you next week.